This episode of Dates and Dead Guys is sponsored by World of Tanks. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. In 1863, a phrenologist in New York City named Orson Fowler was sent the skull of an Apache Indian. It was massive. A decade later, he published a book called The Human Science, or Phrenology, featuring a diagram of the skull with a caption about how in size it had no equal. Its other distinguishing characteristic is that it had a hole from a bullet entering in the back and coming out around the right eye. The Apache was murdered. After he had died, his body was examined. In life, the 70-year-old man measured six foot four, a giant among a people who averaged around five foot six in the 19th century. He was their chief, one who stood out not just because of his size. To the Apache, he was the bravest and wisest, also the most brutal to his enemies. History knows him as Mangus Coloradus, the greatest Apache war chief. In this episode, we are going to see how his life and shameless murder ensure that there could never be a lasting peace between the Americans and free Apache. Prior to the 1840s, Mangus Coloradus was known as Fuerte, a name meaning strong or stout, appropriate for a physical giant. He was born around 1790, but Fuerte likely came to power in his band of copper mine Apache before 1820. They are a subgroup of the Chiricahua and also go by other names. It was common for many Native American groups to have names for people as children and then as adults have a given name as well as other nicknames. Some point out physical characteristics, others a significant event. For Mangus Coloradus, or Fuerte, we see both examples. It wasn't typical for someone in their early 20s to become a chief, but Fuerte wasn't typical. He didn't just stick out because of his size. He grew up in a time of serious turmoil and showed obvious propensities for leadership and wisdom. Between the 1820s and early 1830s, the relationship between Mexico and the Apache began to disintegrate. As an independent country from Spain, they struggled to maintain the previous Presidio system that pacified the Apache of previous generations. The Mexicans would give the Apache rations, and in exchange, they wouldn't raid their villages and towns. That's easy enough. But financial trouble made the Mexican governments be more stingy, and cutbacks on the handouts led to predictable results. If the Mexicans couldn't fulfill their needs with rations as they had promised, the Apache would raid to take what they needed as they always historically did. The results would devastate the states of Sonora and Chihuahua. Dozens of raids began taking place year after year. They were violent, but they didn't always kill people. The goal was usually to gain resources, but casualties were high. As an odd aside, some historians claim that leaving people alive was part of the Apache strategy. They were harvesting from their victims and could raid and take from them again in the future. Mangus Coloradus would say as much, telling an American party in the 1850s, quote, if we kill off all the Mexicans, who will raise the cattle and horses for us, end quote. In a different video, mostly about Geronimo, I detailed the complex Apache relationship to Mexico. If you are interested in that, please check it out. I will link it in the description. But to get us to the next phase of the story, this is what we need to know. Mexico turned to mercenaries and scalp bounties in the 1830s to handle their Apache problem. Honor cultures, like the Apache, meet those types of actions with retaliation and escalating violence. The turning point was an event called the Johnson Massacre. An American, John Johnson, hired by Mexico, had feigned friendship with a group of Apache in 1837. He got the group drunk and, with a hidden swivel cannon and rifleman, killed around two dozen Apache. They were all scalped, including the chief that often worked with Mexican governments, named Juan Jose Campa. Fuerte was rumored to have been there, but escaped when the slaughter started. Raiding was a way of life for the Apache, but incidents like this were different. Deceit was not taken the same way as direct and intentional war parties. It led to some very intense hate. In the 1850s, Mangus Coloradus once told an American army captain, Enoch Steen, that the hatred between the Apache and Mexico was eternal, and that it was, quote, war to the knife, end quote meaning if the Apache had nothing left, they would still go to war with Mexico. Fuerte, as chief, had to make a choice on what his warriors would do next. His decision would earn him his new name. Shortly after the Johnson Massacre, Fuerte led several punitive war parties. In one incident around the Santa Rita copper mines, they killed 22 fur trappers. They followed that up by ambushing a wagon train, moving up to Santa Fe and killed another 12. 
Imagine that scene for a moment. Dozens of Apache waiting to ambush a wagon train. They don't war whoop in the lead up to battle like the Comanche or Lakota. The Apache are quiet. When you see them, you know it's already too late. They are led from the front by a man who is a literal giant for his time. You have heard the rumors about what they do to the capture. Maybe you have even seen things. You know your death won't be quick. Two separate sources reported that the locals near the mines grew so terrified by the attacks that they fled for the Janos Presidio. But in their flight, the Apache killed them by the hundreds. It sounds like death on an impossible scale. And admittedly, some historians are skeptical. There is a lack of Mexican reports to verify it. But two things are true. Following the retribution for the Johnson Massacre, the Santa Rita Copper Mines were abandoned, and the name Fuerte disappeared from the record books. It would be replaced by Mangus Coloradus, Red Sleeves, a name earned because of the blood covering him following the violence. Mangus Coloradus, from this time up until the rise of Cochise, his son-in-law, was the most powerful and respected Apache chief. Relations between the Apache and Mexicans did not improve over the next decade. Bloodshed was relentless on both sides, although it seems pretty clear that the Apache got the better of it. But in 1846 came a serious change. In 1846, Mexico went to war with the United States. We stole Texas, some people are still not over it. But for the Apache, the war was great news. When it appeared the Americans had no intention to inhabit their territory, they initially welcomed them with open arms, and their initial relationship to the Apache was great. There were some bumps. America's peace treaty with Mexico said that they were supposed to intervene to prevent Apache raids into their country. But that order was essentially unenforceable, and the Americans mostly ignored it. The Apache thought that was great. They would raid Mexico, and then return to New Mexico or Arizona, now American territory, where the Mexicans couldn't come get them. The real issue turned out to be gold. American miners had their eyes in the Pinos Altos Mountains in the Chiricahua homeland, Mangus' territory. It was a point of contention. Not because the miners wanted to travel through the territory, the Apache more or less let people through for the gold rush to California. The issue was in the Apache beliefs. They were permitted to pick up pieces of gold in the ground, but mining for it was an insult to Usen, their most prominent god. In January of 1852, there was a significant incident of violence where a small group of Apache were killed by Americans. The Apache retaliated by capturing and killing three other Americans a few days later, as they do. One poor soul was tortured to death and scalped. Scalping was not typical practice for the Chiricahua, but they liked his red hair. So there you go. Cooler Mines prevailed, and Mangus Coloradus, as the most respected Apache chief, signed a peace treaty at Acoma with Colonel Edwin Sumner. Mangus Coloradus was the lone Apache who signed it because no other chief was willing to go. They felt it was likely a trap. This is a notable thing with Mangus Coloradus. He was in his 60s at this point, and as a elder, he was worried about the future of his people. He really wanted peace with the Americans to work and operated in good faith to make that happen. He even got the Americans to promise the Apache rations. He felt that would go a long way in preventing them from raiding. Even as a chief, he didn't have any legal authority over his people. They followed him because they respected him, so he worked very hard to put them in a good position. In exchange for rations, the Apache had to take up agriculture. It was not their strong suit, but they were making an effort. One last notable thing about the Treaty of Acoma was that Mangus Coloradus did not acknowledge giving up any lands. In his mind, Apacheria belonged to his people. That and good faith among the Americans were his lines in the sand. For the next decade, through the 1850s, things went more or less well between the Apache and the Americans. There was an incident in 1856 where the Coyotero Apache killed an Indian agent. The U.S. wanted Mangus' help in catching the Apache, but he was unsure if they were guilty. So when the Americans tried to approach, he had set a forest fire and helped the Coyotero escape into Mexico. The Americans didn't like that, or that a 65-year-old was still leading others into Mexico for war parties, or that the Apache were not being great farmers. They didn't grow much, and much of what they did grow was corn, and they made most of that into an alcohol called Tiswin. Not what the army had intended, but they continued to issue the Apache rations anyway. For Mangus Coloradus, it was really the miners that made the relationship go south. 
Around 1860, there were enough miners in the Pinos Altos Mountains that conflicts between the Apache and the miners were becoming more common. Violence was growing likely. But Mangus Coloradus took a different approach. Now about 70, he took up the habit of visiting the miners. He would tell them about the gold that existed just south in the mountains of Mexico. He even promised a bunch of them that he would show them where it was. But something went wrong. The miners felt the tension with the Apache, and they got the sense the old man was trying to lure them into a trap. It is not truly verified, but according to legend, on one of his visits, a group of miners seized him, and to teach him a lesson, they bound the old chief to a tree. They then lashed him with an ox whip until his back had deep cuts. This would have been humiliating for him. For the Apache not to retaliate would only demonstrate how dedicated Mangus was to peace with the Americans. Other Apache were having similar tense engagements, and despite Mangus's commitment, relations were starting to crack. In the next year, 1861, they would completely shatter. Completely separate from Mangus Coloradus was the infamous Bascom Affair. If you are not familiar with the incident, the Chiricahua are accused by Lieutenant George Bascom of having kidnapped a boy named Felix Ward off of a local ranch. He was actually kidnapped by a completely different group of Apache. Regardless, the army meets with Cochise along with several of his family members. Cochise is Mangus Coloradus' son-in-law, probably the most powerful Apache chief at this point. Mangus Coloradus was over 70. The Americans took Cochise hostage, but he escaped by cutting a hole through a canvas tent with a knife before running off into the mountains. His family was not able to escape. Cochise then captured several Americans and in the days that followed tried to negotiate a prisoner exchange with the Americans. The negotiations failed and Cochise in turn tortured his prisoners to death. He left them mutilated for the army to find. In return, Lieutenant Bascom had Cochise's family hanged. As a result of this incident and the offenses of the miners, Mangus Coloradus joins Cochise and they agree to go to war with the Americans. They wanted to force them to leave their territory entirely. Near Cook's Canyon, south of the Pinos Altos Mountains, raids against Americans in the area would kill over a hundred. A verifiable number. The canyon got a reputation for it. This part of the story offers the first real glimpse of what it was like to battle the Apache. It wasn't just that they fought and killed. Their brutality cannot be overstated. One commander wrote that Cook's Canyon was, quote, sadly to face with human bones and graves, end quote. Torture of prisoners was common, and Cochise particularly had a habit of suspending people upside down about a foot and a half over an open fire. Due to the hostilities, the Americans returned with a new approach to the Apache. Major General James Henry Carleton was put in charge of operations in New Mexico, and he took on a policy that was intolerant. As Cochise and Mangus planned their next attack, Carleton was instituting a policy of extermination. In July 1862, Mangus Coloradus and Cochise attempted to attack a large group of Americans going through the Apache Pass in Arizona. Cochise felt that his 200 warriors would have an easy victory over the 95 Americans that would have to travel 40 miles without water to get to the pass. What should have been a massive victory turned into a disaster. With no water between the pass and Tucson, the Americans would have to go to an abandoned station in the area with a spring. Just a few hundred yards from the spring is where the Apache would launch their attack. Initially, they had the upper hand from a numerical advantage and the element of surprise. But the Americans were equipped with howitzer cannons, a weapon the Apache were unprepared for. In the battle, they used sheltered positions to send rifle volleys at the Americans. But they were destroyed by returning cannon fire, and the Americans were able to get the Apache to retreat. The Americans were still worried about their supply lines. Following just miles behind them were countless wagons that were vulnerable. Six soldiers were sent out to warn them on horseback. Mangus Coloradus and about another 20 Apache chased the messengers. When they caught up, they shot the horse out from a man named John Teal. He took cover behind the horse as the Apache approached. Teal felt that he was going to die, and he was desperate to take someone with him. He raised his rifle from behind the horse. When he did, he saw a giant among the Apache approaching him. He took aim, fired, and shot him directly in the chest. Mangus Coloradus fell to the ground, and the Apache immediately moved to rescue him, leaving John Teal alive. The Apache then rode through the night and traveled 120 miles with the wounded chief to Janos, where there was a doctor that they knew. When they reached the home of the doctor, they laid Mangus Coloradus on the table. They told the doctor that if he died, they would kill everyone in the whole town. 
whether by skill or by luck, Mangus Coloradus lived. But the Battle of Apache Pass was a disaster, and as Mangus would recover, he would be determined to take a different route moving forward. Understanding that the Apache were outmatched by the Americans, Mangus now wanted to find a way for there again to be peace. They have no weapons that can compete with the American cannons. Their warriors were horribly outnumbered by the American soldiers, and it seemed that since their actions at Cook's Canyon, that the political will for the Americans to fight them was in place. He understood that war with the Americans was futile, but for Mangus Coloradus, it was already too late. General Carleton was set on a policy of extermination toward the Apache, one that mirrored their own brutality in Cook's Canyon. Unknowingly, Mangus Coloradus' search for peace was going to lead him to his own end. Before he met with the Americans, Mangus Coloradus conferred again with other Apache leaders like Cochise. He told them of his plans for peace and that he wanted to call for a parlay. They tried to talk him out of it, but he believed that it was their only way forward. Mangus went to the Americans in January of 1863. As he rode up to a meeting with a white flag, rifles were raised against him and he was taken prisoner. He was then put into the custody of Brigadier General Joseph West. Carlton had made it clear to West prior that he didn't trust Mangus Coloradus' wish for peace and that the policies toward the Apache were to be followed. Before being sent off to the guards, West and Mangus Coloradus have a meeting. Through a translator, both men talk past each other, ignoring the injuries of the other and rather symbolically being unable to come to any sort of mutual understanding. Just before Mangus Coloradus was sent away, West turned one final time and warned him that if he tried to escape, the soldiers guarding him had been ordered to kill him. That night was dreary and bitterly cold. Mangus Coloradus was at the only fire in the camp. Two guards were stationed with him. At around 1 a.m., he laid on the ground wrapped in a blanket that was small for a giant man and light for the conditions. But the old chief didn't complain. To pester him, the guards began heating their bayonets in the fire and prodding his legs and feet. They wanted him to react. After enough abuse was had, Mangus raised a protest, yelling at the soldiers that he was not a child to be played with. At this point, they both raised their rifles and shot him. A third soldier then walked up to the fallen body and put another round through the back of his head. Later, it was discovered that the men were effectively acting under orders. West reportedly had told them, quote, that old murderer has got away from every soldier command and has left a trail of blood for 500 miles. I want him dead, end quote. In the morning, the body was scalped and partially buried after being thrown in a gully. A few days later, after West left on another assignment, the soldiers dug up the body. They decapitated it and boiled the head before sending it to the phrenologist Orson Fowler in New York. When the Apache discovered what happened to Mangus Coloradus, they were enraged like never before. Geronimo later said that the murder of Mangus was, quote, perhaps the worst wrong ever done to the Indians, end quote. Mangus Coloradus had gone to the Americans for peace, and he was betrayed. And the Apache believed a person went to the afterlife in the state in which they died, which meant that he would be headless for eternity. With the Bascom affair, the Apache wars had already started, but if not for the mutilation of Mangus Coloradus, the Apache may have been able to eventually come to peace with the Americans. The reasons why the Americans were forced to fight the Apache for 25 years was that the Apache didn't trust them. The Chiricahua were united as Apache because of the murder, despite the inevitable fate that was coming. As for the head of Mangus Coloradus, it is missing to this day. So far, I have focused a ton on 19th century history and the stories I tell on this channel. But one thing I cannot wait to get into is the impact of modern technology on human conflicts. That's why when I had a chance to partner with World of Tanks, I was very excited. World of Tanks is the ultimate in armored multiplayer combat. Join the battlefield and play online for free by going to the link provided in the episode description. The game focuses on massive tank battles, the way that you would imagine some of the armored conflicts in World War II but it also includes over 800 authentic tanks from World War I through the Cold War. From light to medium builds to heavy giants, it gives you the freedom to play in any style you like in hyper-realistic gameplay. 
You can be a berserker, trying to meet your team's objective through force, or you can take a stealthier and more strategic approach. It may be smarter to do that. You rightfully take some damage by recklessly crossing open spaces. It is honestly my favorite part of the game. Strategy matters. Elements like concealment and armor angles play a massive role in being successful. Real strategies like cover and flanking are huge. Luckily, the tutorial to start the game makes it easy to learn and start playing fast. Plus, if you register now using the link in the description, you can score some exclusive rewards. Click the link and use the invite code COMBAT. All capitals. Tanks are loud, so you gotta yell. If you do, you'll gain access to a British tank called the Cromwell B, a medium tank with a well-rounded out skill set, 250,000 game credits, and 7 days of premium access. Additionally, you'll get some awesome rentals. For 10 battles each, you'll gain access to the Chinese Type 64, the American T-78, and the legendary German Tiger 131. This offer is exclusive to new players when you register to play. Use the link in the description now and become a legend in armored combat. Thanks for watching the video. I hope that you enjoyed it and you come back to check out some of the other ones on the channel. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future videos, please send them in. And we'll hopefully get to all those.